morning, church. My name is Glenn. I'm one of the pastors here at Sierra Bible Church, and it's my great joy and privilege to be able to share with you God's Word this morning. Uh, so if you have a copy of God's Word, uh, why don't you turn with me to the book of Judges, chapter um, 6, and we're going to be beginning in verse 33. How's everybody's fantasy team doing? Who, who, who's currently like in the top percentage of your league? Anybody? Anybody who's playing? Who is like me and is more middle tier to the bottom? Any others? Yeah. So for those of you that are unfamiliar with what fantasy football is, because maybe some of you are like, you hear people talk about this, you're like, I don't even know what that even means. Is it like uh, you're recruiting D&D characters to go out to battle for you uh, as, as and play football? No, no. Here's what fantasy football is. At the beginning of a season, you join a league, sometimes with friends, sometimes with anonymous folks, and you get together and you choose, you pick out different uh, real life NFL, uh, players to be on your team. And depending on how, uh, that team performs every single week, you get a certain amount of points for them. So if you draft a quarterback, you know, you're getting points if they're throwing, uh, passes and they, they go for a lot of yards, they're scoring touchdowns or they're running the ball. Or if you get a wide receiver, it's how many of their balls they're catching and how far they're running or if they score touchdowns. Or if you have a, a defense, uh, how many times they're intercepting the ball or sacking the quarterback, right? So, and, and you go, uh, every single week, you face a different opponent. And you try to score the most points, depending on picking the right guys to have on your team. And really, what I found for me is the, my entire season depends on the draft, right? The first guys that you're picking to be on your team. Sometimes there's some unknowns, sometimes there's some key players, but that's really where it all hinges down on. And as I was thinking about that this week, I started thinking about how, how might God do at fantasy football? And I think he'd do a bad job. Now, hear me out for a second. I know some of you are like, whoa, 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 that sounds blasphemous. But no, no, look, hear me out, okay? I think God probably wouldn't do that great of a job at fantasy football. And here is why. I know he's sovereign, knows all things, everything else like that. But if you look at God's track record for the kind of people he picks to put on his team, the kind of people he selects for his purposes, for his calling, and he kind of transfers that over to playing football, how's his season going to go? See, God doesn't choose impressive people. God doesn't choose to use mighty, important, significant people for his key. He picks the unexpected, doesn't he? He picks the down and out. He's, he, he, he drafts his team a lot like the Bears do, <laughs> right? They choose somebody like, like uh, uh, Mitch Trubisky over somebody like Patrick Mahomes. That's a, that's, that would be the kind of model... I think that God would follow, really. If he was play, if he was in our, my league right now, he probably would only draft people from the Jets and the Jaguars. That's it. That's how God operates. Why is that? Well, that's what we're going to look at this morning. We're going to look at why it might be that God chooses to use the down and out, the unimpressive, the weak. God only uses weak People. And we're going to look at why that is in our text this morning. We are in the book of Judges. Last week, we started the story of Gideon, right? And Gideon was this really cynical dude who was hiding in a hole at the time that God called him to his purposes. You see, uh, some Midianite and Amalekite raiders, some people were coming in on their camels, and they every harvest season, they would show up, and they would start plundering the people of Israel again and again and again and again. This happened for seven years, and the people of God were crying out to God, why is this happening? And God said, you've abandoned me. You've left me. You've not worshiped me. You've been worshiping false gods. And instead of leaving them to their own devices, God still has decided to save his people, to deliver them. So he raises up this man that he's going to use to deliver you, a man named Gideon, a man who's cynical, who doesn't see God at work in his people. And yet God still lovingly brings him along to call him to his purposes. So now we're, we've seen the man has been called. Now we're going to see what it is God does through Gideon to redeem his people. So let's take a look, starting in verse 33 of the book of Judges, chapter 6. This is what it says. Now all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east came together, and they crossed the Jordan and encamped in the valley of Jezreel. But the Spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon, and he sounded the trumpet, and the Abiezrites were called out to follow him. And he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, and they too were called out to follow him. 
And he sent messengers to Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali. And they went up to meet them. All right, so quick, setting the stage. All the graders are in the valley, the Midianites, the Malachites, everybody else, are there to plunder the people of Israel yet again for now the eighth time. And Gideon starts going out recruiting people from four different tribes. He goes out, and this is interesting, who he, he calls out. He calls his own tribe. He calls three other different tribes. And these people come out. Not only that, there's another group of people. Did you see it? The Abiezrites, did you see that there? Who is that? Well, if you remember last week, Gideon went into his dad's house to destroy some idols that the people were worshiping. Well, guess who wanted Gideon's head? These people. That it's literally the people coming out to join Gideon are the people the very day before who were calling for Gideon's death. And Gideon, by his own admission, is not important. He says, I'm from an unimportant family, from an unimportant clan, from the, the least of the tribes of Israel. Why would you choose me? And if that's his own reputation, how on earth is he able to recruit four different tribes to his cause to deliver the people of Israel? Well, the text tells us. Did you see it? It's verse 34. What happened to Gideon? The Spirit of the Lord clothed him. God in his spirit empowers Gideon to be this phenomenal leader to convince people who otherwise would not follow a man like him. And they all rally out to join Gideon in this fight. So if you're Gideon, how are you feeling at this point? You've been hesitant up, up to now, but you're like, okay. Okay, people are starting to follow me. But in the back of Gideon's mind, he, he, see, he doesn't know this God very well. He, do, he doesn't know that this is a God who keeps his promises. So he's a bit unsure that God is really going to follow through with what he's calling him to do. So look what happens next in verse 36. Then Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand, as you said, behold, I'm laying a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there's dew on the fleece alone and it's dry on the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand as you said. And it was so. When he arose early the next morning and squeezed out the fleece, he wrung enough dew from the fleece to fill a bowl with water. Then Gideon said to God, let not your anger burn against me. Let me speak just once more. Please let me test just once more with the fleece. Please let it be dry on the fleece only and on the ground then let there be do. And God did so that night, and it was dry on the fleece only, and all on all the ground there was dew. So here's what's going on. Gideon is still unsure that this God is going to come through for him, and so he starts asking God for signs. He says, here's what, I'm going to take a blanket, I'm going to lay it outside in my backyard, and when I wake up in the morning, don't let there be any moisture anywhere else on the ground, but just on that blanket. So he does, wakes up in the morning, rings that thing out. He feels like a couple gallons worth of water into a big bowl, okay? He says, uh, I still need more proof that you're actually going to follow through with this. So now I want you to do the reverse. I'm going to throw a blanket out there. This time, only get the ground wet. Leave the blanket alone. Let it be dry. God does it. Now, have you guys ever heard the phrase, somebody says, hey, you know, you want to put a fleece out? Christians will use this. And usually it's a sign to say, I want to, I'm trying to discern what God wants. What Gideon's doing here is not a good thing. Gideon is not trying to discern God's will. Here's what Gideon's doing. He doesn't believe, he doesn't trust that God's really going to do as he said. Is Gideon unclear about what God's call in his life is at this point? No, he knows exactly what God's told him to do. He's not trying to figure it out. He knows what it is. His testing is not to figure out what to do. His testing is testing of the character of God to discern whether God is actually going to follow through with what he has said. So this is, don't, don't put a fleece out, okay? That is not a Christian notion. Just do what God tells you to do. Trust his character. Be assured that he will do what he has said he will do. Now, why does God do this? Why does God basically listen to Gideon and perform these things. Well, number one, God's patient, isn't he? He's patient with us even when we're idiots, especially when we are, right? God puts up with me at all times. At no time is God saying, well, man, I'm really glad I have appointed Glenn for this role. 
but he's patient with me. He's patient with Gideon. And more than that, God wants to get the ball rolling and save his people. So he's willing to do this because he knows, I, I am going to save my people, and I'm going to move forward, even using an imperfect vessel like Gideon. I need to get this ball rolling. So God listens. God does it to move on to the next phase. Now, do you think that's going to be enough for our buddy Gideon to charge headlong into battle? It is not. It is not. Gideon is still going to be uh, a little hesitant. Look at verse 1 of chapter 7. Then Jeroboam, that is Gideon. Now, quick time out. Jeroboam is Gideon's nickname that he got called for breaking down the altar built to Baal. It was kind of a, the nickname meant let, let Baal contend uh, for himself. It's let, let Baal fight it out, right? And that's his nickname. And it's interesting that the author calls him by this name here. Why? Why does he use this kind of pagan sounding name? Well, because how is Gideon operating in the previous verses? Kind of like a pagan, right? The way he's treating God. He says, Jeroboam, oh, Gideon, Gideon, right? Gideon and all the people who are with him, he says in verse 1, rose early and encamped beside the spring of Harad, and the camp of Midian was north of them by the hill of Morah in the valley. And the Lord said to Gideon, and this, is, this verse is key to understanding this whole passage. Highlight it if, if, you're, if you don't believe it's blasphemous to write in your Bible. Highlight it. The Lord said to Gideon, the people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into your hand. Lest Israel boast over me, saying, my own hand has saved me. That doesn't make any sense if you're Gideon. He's just spent a couple days doing what? Recruiting this big old army. He's got them all there. Now, now it would make sense if, if God came to Gideon and said to Gideon, man, the, the people that you're facing, there's just too many of them. I can't save you. Gideon could understand that. Or if God said, hey, you just don't have enough people to, to take this enemy. Gideon could understand that. But that's not what he says. God goes to Gideon and says, Gideon, you have way too many people to be able to let me save you. You got too many. You got too many soldiers to be able to be delivered by me. Why? Lest you boast and think you're the one doing the saving. You see, God is interested in displaying his power, his might, his glory in the lives of his people. And so God says, we got a problem, Gideon. You got way too many folks. You're going to think it's by your own human strength that you've been delivered from the hand of the Midianites. You got too many folks. So we need to start thinning the herd. We need, to we need to start getting rid of some people in here so that you can now be <laughs> savable. Because our God is the kind of God who when he acts, he wants there to be zero confusion or misunderstanding of who it is that's really doing the action. He wants to remove all doubt. He wants to accomplish the impossible. And so he wants to pull the rug out from their human strength and their human ability and human power. So he says, Gideon, we got to do something. So he's going to go through a process of eliminating some people from Gideon's army. And so he says this, verse 3. Now therefore proclaim in the ears of all the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and trembling, let him return home and hurry away from Mount Gilead. Then 22,000 of the people returned and 10,000 remained. All right. For you math wizards, how many people do you start with? Man, there's, I heard so many wrong answers right now. I'm very disheartened. That's right. We, were, we just read 1 Corinthians 1 for you guys. Don't worry. 32,000 people is what he started with. Gideon says, hey, if you're a little nervous, do what? Go home. Two-thirds of his army just leaves and walks out. So you're Gideon, okay? You've just amassed this massive army, and now two-thirds have said, yeah, we're too scared. We're going to go home. How you feeling? A little shaky? A little nervous? It's like, huh, okay, this is going to be interesting, fighting this battle with only 10,000 people. Yeah, let's see if we can actually do that. All right, we'll see how it goes. All right, so he's starting to get a little nervous. And then God starts doing his God thing again. Look at this. Uh, we're in verse 4. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people are still too many. <laughs> so Gideon, you still got 10,000 is too much, Gideon. And Gideon's probably like, you got to be killing me, God. 
How am I going to take on this force with anything less than 10,000? This, this isn't going to happen. So he's going to thin them down even more. 10,000 or two, two may take them down to the water and I will test them for you there. And any one of whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, shall go with you. Any one of whom I say, this one shall not go with you, shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water and the Lord said to Gideon, everyone who laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set by himself. Likewise, everyone who kneels down to drink. And the number who lapped, putting their hands to their mouths, was 300 men. But all the rest of the people knelt down to drink water. And the Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men who lapped, I will save you. And I'll give the Midianites in your hand. And let all the others go every man to his home. So the people took provisions in their hands and their trumpets, and he sent all the rest of Israel, every man to his tent, but retained the 300 men, and the camp of Midian was below him in the valley. What on earth just happened? So God says, everyone needs to go get a drink. So they all go down to the spring to get a drink. And it's some kind of, the, the, the Hebrew's kind of janky here, and so it's kind of trying to figure out what is actually taking place. So basically, it's something like this. When you're going to go down to a stream or river and you're going to drink, you got really two basic ways you can handle it. You can get down on your knees and kind of scoop up a drink, or you could go down, scoop up in your hand some water, and drink like this. Those are kind of the two ways, okay? And so everyone goes down, they start drinking like this, and only 300 of them do this, scoop it up, and drink. Now, there's been a lot of commotion made about this by Christians over the years about how God chose these 300 people because they're more spry or more alert, right? They're like, they're like not even turn their back to anyone. They're drinking and they're, you know, they're kind of, people talk about this. That's not what's going on here, okay? It does not matter how they drink their water. Guess what matters? One group was super tiny and the other group was really big. Had it been reversed and most of them scooped up with their hands and stood and only 300 knelt down, guess which group he would have chosen? The 300 group. Why? Because God is int interested in displaying his strength and his power, and so he wants to shrink the forces down so much that it's impossible for them to win at all. That's all that matters here. So he has brought out 32,000 people, and God says, actually, let's just do it with 300. That's what we're going to use this time. So get your stuff, send everybody home, and you 300, you are going to go down to fight. And you're Gideon, and you've seen this massive, I mean, 32,000 people, that's like, you're, you're thinking like Lord of the Rings kind of stuff, right? That, that's kind of what you're thinking there. And instead, now you've just got this little tiny group. And you're Gideon, and you're like, yeah, I know he said he's going to use me, but this is absolutely terrifying. I, I don't know if this is going to happen. God knows this about Gideon. And so God's going to be super gracious to Gideon, and he's going to give him yet more assurance to his fear. So look at what happens. Verse 9. That same night, the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp, for I have given it into your hand. But if you're afraid to go down, go down to the camp with Pura, your servant. And you shall hear what they say, and afterwards your hand shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. What does God already know about Gideon? He's afraid. And God says, I know you're afraid. So if you want, buddy, you can sneak down to the camp. Just listen in. Just listen to what's happening. And then you'll be fine. So Gideon listens. Gideon's like, well, yes, I'm scared. I'm going to go take it. I'm going to go get encouraged if that's really what's going to happen. So then Gideon went down with Pira, his servant, to the outposts of the armed men who were in the camp. Verse 12. And the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the people of the east lay along the valley like locusts in abundance. And their camels were without number as the sand that is on the seashore in abundance. So how many people are we talking about? A little more than 300, can we agree there? Thousands upon thousands of just the camels, right? They're like locusts infesting the land of Israel. What's 300 people going to accomplish? Nothing. So he's like having to sneak behind enemy lines here, and they're just reminding us, by the way, this is an impossible situation for Gideon. So he sneaks down, verse 13. 
When Gideon came, behold, a man was telling a dream to his comrade. And he said, Behold, I dreamed a dream, and behold, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the can of Midian and came to the tent, struck it, so it fell and turned it upside down so that the tent lay flat. That's a ridiculous dream. Amen? The guy just dreamed a birthday cake rolled down a hill and smashed into somebody's tent. One of my kids was telling me about a strange dream they had the other night. There was a frog in their pants. That's a strange dream to have. Our dreams are often bizarre. This guy's dream, also very bizarre. What does it mean? Well, I don't think anyone listening in, I don't think, I don't think Gideon was like, oh, okay, now I'm encouraged. No, somebody does know what the dream means, and it's the guy's buddy that he's talking to. Listen to what his buddy says in response to this cake dream that he has. Verse 14, his comrade answered, this is no other than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. God's given into his hand Midian and all the camp. So somehow... That guy knows of Gideon, knows where Gideon's from, and knows that God's going to use Gideon, and somehow interprets that dream in a way that leads him to say, oh, Gideon's going to beat us. So God is so sovereign, he says, I I want you to go down, Gideon, and listen to what you're going to hear. And he hears, walks up at just the right time for this guy to hear this really weird dream, to tell his buddy, and his buddy knows Gideon's been given the victory by the Lord. Now you're Gideon, how are you feeling? You're feeling pretty good now, aren't you? Look look at how Gideon responds. This is the first time Gideon starts acting like a real man of God in this one moment here. He says, verse 15, as soon as Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation, what's it say? He worshiped. He worshiped God. And he returned to the camp of Israel. He said, arise for the Lord's given the host of Midian into your hand. And he divided the 300 men into three companies. And he put trumpets into the hands of all them and empty jars with torches inside the jars. And he said to them, look at me and do likewise. When I come to the outskirt of the camp, do as I do. When I blow the trumpet, I and all who are with me, then blow the trumpets also on every side of the camp and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. So Gideon gets the shot in the arm that he needs, right? He's encouraged. He says, okay, this, this God's going to come through for me. doesn't matter that I only have 300. Fine. He goes back and he outlines the, the, the plan of attack, which is probably a plan he got from God himself, not his own, own doing, because it's kind of ridiculous, right? The, their plan is, I want you to bring a bunch of trumpets and I, brought, I want you to get some torches going and then cover them up with a jar. That's the plan. And then just follow, follow my lead. And so they're like, okay, well, let's go down and see how this is going to work. So they go down to the camp in verse 19. So Gideon... And the hundred men who were with him came to the outskirts of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch when they just set watch. And they blew the trumpets and smashed the jars that were in their hands. Then the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the jars. They held in their left hand the torches and in their right hand the trumpet to blow. And they cried out, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Quick question, what don't they have in their hands? A sword. They went to a fight with zero weapons. They've got instruments and pottery. They're going down to fight this fight without any weapons at all. They're walking in. And so they surround the camp. So they're also spread pretty thin. They smash the jars. They start blowing horns. You can start seeing the torches light up. How on earth is this going to play out? How are they going to defeat anybody without a sword? Well, it tells us, verse 21, every man stood in his place around the camp and all the army ran. They cried out and fled. When they blew the 300 trumpets, the Lord said, every man's sword against his comrade and against all the army. And the army fled as far as Beth Shittah towards Zerera, as far as the border of Abel Meholah by Tabath. And the men of Israel were called out from Naphtali and Asher and from all Manasseh, and they pursued After Midian, God defeats the army on his own. They don't lift a finger. They play some horns and and, and, and throw their flashlights around, and that's all they've got going for them. And God puts the army into a panic, 
ends up having them killing themselves, and they start fleeing. Gideon's confidence has started to build back up, hasn't it? But there's a danger to that confidence. Because as the army flees, what does Gideon do? Did you see it? He just sent who home? 32,000 troops, minus 300, right? From all these different tribes. Now that they're winning, what do they do? They call those same people back. Come on and pursue them. And in fact, they don't just stop there. They're going to recruit yet another tribe to come and help them. Look at verse uh, uh, 24. Gideon sent messengers throughout all the hill country of Ephraim, saying, come down against the Midianites, capture the waters against them as far as Beth Barah and also the Jordan. So the men of Ephraim were called out. And they captured the waters as far as Beth Barah and also the Jordan. And the, they captured the two princes of Midian, these two officials, Oreb and Zeb. They killed Oreb at the rock of Oreb, and they killed Zeb uh, at the wine press of Zeb. I'm, I'm guessing they weren't already named that until they were after they killed, so just so you know. Then they pursued Midian, and they brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon across the Jordan. Why does he recruit all these other people all of a sudden? See, I think in his confidence... He begins to default, like we all do, towards dependence on human agency. He begins to recruit more people to come in and help. And you already see the wheels with Gideon starting to come off pretty quick. You're going to see that in the coming passages um, as we take, we're going to take a hiatus uh, from uh, this passage, uh, from this, this book for Christmas and all that. And next year, when we come back in January, We'll kind of see how the wheels continue to come off for Gideon. But you kind of even see here little glimmers, little, little, little wonders of what's, what's going on here with Gideon. Well, what do we do with this text this morning? I've said this multiple times since we've been in the book of Judges, and this is a recurring theme in the book of Judges. God only uses broken, messed up, weak, unimportant people. That's who he uses. It's why uh, we had this scripture reading this morning from 1 Corinthians. God always operates this, this way. He chooses the weak. He chooses the foolish. He chooses the marginalized. That's how he operates. Why does God do this? Well, we saw it in verse 2, didn't we? So that we might not boast. God wants to remove all claims that we have to saving ourselves and accomplishing things for ourselves. He wants the glory. He wants the honor. He wants the praise. And so when God acts, he uses human agents that don't qualify or fit the bill for deliverance. That's how he's operated towards you and me in our salvation. Consider the whole point of the gospel. God sends his son to do the thing that we cannot do. What percentage of your salvation is owed to your own doing? Zero. God alone saves. He came to do that which you and I could never do. That which we could not accomplish on our own. He is the one who is in control. He is the one who is savior. He is deliverer. He's not making a partnership with us kind of 50-50. Hey, I'll meet you halfway if you come the other half of the way. No, he is a God that does it all. He comes into our helpless situation where it's impossible for us to do anything for ourselves and he intervenes and he brings redemption. That is what Christ accomplished for us on the cross. He died the death we deserve to die. He lived a life we should have been living and he did it all in our place. Right? It's not that we were limping in this race to get across the finish line and Jesus comes in and he shoulders us and says, hey, buddy, I'm going to help you get across. No, he comes in and picks us up. We've already transpired. We've fallen over in the race. He's picking us up, throwing us over his shoulder, and he's going to do the entire work the rest of the way. He is not partnering with us in that way in our salvation. He is a God who demands honor, praise, Glory. He does not share it with anyone else. And that includes in our salvation, in our ministry, in our work. I want to I share with you guys this morning 
a struggle that I've been wrestling with for the last couple of years. As I survey what we do as the church in this country, in our own local church, churches around the world, as I, as I look at it, I, I, I frequently want to ask this question and wrestle with this question. How much of what we do is dependent on the supernatural for success to happen? And I look at what, what counts as, as I look at my own ministry and I look at, well, what, what counts as success? Well, how many people did I get to show up to youth group? Or how many people I, I, I get to, to preach to or, or, or share with or, or how big of a service I have or, or what it becomes the mark of success. Look at our impressive buildings and facilities or our, our big budgets or these different ministries that we're, all these opportunities that we have and, and how much we're doing and how much of what we do depends on the supernatural for it to take place. See, I think sometimes the way churches get structured in our country is, is there's this idea that you just need this kind of rock star, superstar leaders and staff, and everybody else kind of comes and supports what goes on. But super gifted, amazing, incredible staff do not bring glory to God the same way unimportant, ordinary, unimpressive people do. I wonder... How much of the time we as the church, myself as an individual, am trying to build up 32,000 soldier strategies rather than a 300 soldier strategy? See, I believe God is in doing incredible things through incredibly ordinary people. And that's what brings glory to God. God is in the ordinary. And God does incredible, extraordinary things through weak people like us. I want to give you kind of three very ordinary, very unintuitive things that I believe God accomplishes great, extraordinary, supernatural things through. Thing number one, you ready? Ordinary prayer. That's why we're having us fill this thing up. It's not because bottles are impressive and sheets are impressive, but what is the point of this? What is the point of putting names in into a jar? That we might pray for these people. What is prayer? Prayer is pleading with God to act over us. It is coming before him and saying, I can't do it. You're going to have to do it. I am powerless to do anything in my situation. You alone are the one who can do it. Our prayerlessness is one of the biggest uh, acts of arrogance we can commit. Because when we don't pray, when I don't pray, it's because I think I've got it. That's why I only pray when things get really bad in my life. Because the whole time up to this point, I've been thinking, oh no, I'm, I'm doing pretty good. I don't need God to intervene. Now, I wouldn't be so crass to say it that way and you wouldn't either, but that's how we're operating, isn't it? We're prayerless. We're not praying. We're not begging God to act and intervene in our lives. And prayer is just not intuitive. Right? Often, this is how I operate. Often, I'll make sure I pray just because I know it's the thing we're supposed to do, but it's not the thing I'm desperate to do. Prayer is not that thing which is driving and funneling and fueling all that I'm trying to do. I think, well, I got to get going. Stuff needs to be done, right? So yeah, let's get through the prayer stuff so we can get to where the real action is. No, church, no. Let's seek God to do something big. Are you going to pray for the people you put in this bottle? The names you put in your wallet, so your purse. That is what's going to do a difference in their life. That is what is going to accomplish something supernatural. It's you're lifting them up in desperation before God, that God would do something. Ordinary prayer by ordinary people. That accomplishes great things. Here's a second ordinary thing that I believe God calls us to do, to do great things. Ordinary Bible intake. Both reading God's word, sitting underneath the preaching of his word, studying his word together. Why? Why is that such a big deal? Well, it doesn't really make sense, right? Because, because people, I you mean, there's a lot of strategies that are out there to, to grow a church or to, to reach people. And uh, focusing a whole lot of time on an ancient book doesn't seem to be towards the top of the list. 
Are we a people willing to devote ourselves to God's word and sit underneath its teaching? Or do we want to bring in other uh, worldly wisdom to kind of help us accomplish our purposes? We should be devoting ourselves to this, this book and the gospel contained in it. That's why we spend so much time teaching here at this church. It's because we know this to be true. God is going to accomplish great things through his word. And I don't want to be up here to be eloquent and everything else to try to convince you. I want to just convince you of what this book says. And say, guys, we need to do this thing right here. This is how we have to to live. Let's go to God and hear from him and have him guide us in all that we do. The scriptures, God's word, is very ordinary and unintuitive. But if we want to see God do great things we got to submit ourselves to what's happening in this book and, and internalize it. Third ordinary thing. If we want to see God do great things in our midst, we're praying, we're, we're spending time in God's word. Third ordinary thing, spend time with other Christians. Be gathered together. The church is not a service on Sunday morning. The church is not a facility, a building. The church is a people. It is a family of God. And I think we often think about our spirituality as being very individualistic, that it's me and Jesus versus the world. But that is not the case. It is you and Jesus and his people versus the world. And if you want to see extraordinary things happen in your life, be sure to commit yourself to the very ordinary gathering together of God's people regularly. You and I need each other to function, and and we treat the church like it's this kind of buffet. It's a very consumeristic thing. I just want to go around and, and see what's in it for me and see what I can get out of it. When God's calling us to be a part of a family, a community of faith, a community built on the gospel and knowing him, it's very ordinary. It's very uninspiring. It's very... Boring for a lot of people. But you are called to be a part of this family, and this is the realm in which God is doing amazing and great things. What is that extraordinary, remarkable, crazy, impossible thing that God is doing through the ordinary prayers, Bible study, and gathering of his people? He is transforming people's lives. Anybody can get someone to fill out a response card, right? That's easy. You just pass them outside of Walmart long enough, they'll, they'll check something off. How is real life change going to happen? It's going to be through us lifting people up in prayer. It's going to be through us saturating ourselves with God's word and sharing it with others. And it's going to be from our common gathering with each other. And we're going to see God do incredible things. See, God only does the remarkable through the ordinary And we need to return, as the church in this country, we need to return to a 300-person mindset, not a 32,000-person mindset. To be unintuitive, to be weak, and to devote ourselves to this great God we serve. Because you know what? When somebody's life is transformed, just because you've been praying for them, who gets the credit for that? I mean, how many times as a person that you've been praying for for years and years and years and years, and when they finally see their life transformed, they come to Christ, how many times they come up and they say, man, it's such a good thing you prayed for me. Good job on you. You were so smart. No, who gets the credit for that? God does. God does. You know when I see people most uh, influenced by when I teach? It's the closer I am to this book. I've done a horrible job if you come away on a Sunday morning and you say, wow, that was really impressive speaking. I don't know how we got there, but that was great. But when you come up and you say, oh, I see, I see it for myself. I see what's going on in God's word here. That's exciting. And you begin to see your life transform. That is, that is what is going to lead to life transformation, getting into this book, not in me being clever. The same is true for you. The same is true for me. God works through extra, does extraordinary things through very ordinary, weak, unimportant people. Now, friend, you might be sitting in here 
You might have a whole plan for your life of how you think you're going to accomplish greatness and how you think you're going to move forward. You've got all these plans of, of how to correct and fix everything in your life. And I'm telling you right now, it's not going to work. Your situation's too hopeless. And you probably have a lot of confidence that, no, I feel like I could pull myself out of this. No, you can't. You can't. You need somebody who only deals in hopeless cases. His name is Jesus. He alone is a solution you need to whatever it is you're facing right now. So put aside all these plans to get, get yourself out of the hole you've dug for yourself and turn to him and let him do something incredible. So if you want to know how you can start a relationship with this God, this God who only intervenes with helpless people, talk with me. Talk with one of our pastors. We would love to share with you how you can start a relationship with Jesus who can enter into your helpless case, just like my helpless case, and all these others here, we're all helpless. How you can allow him to do for you what only he can. So church, let's be ordinary. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your kindness this morning that you would call us as your people. As we saw in the scripture reading this morning, not many of us are impressive. Not many of us are powerful. Not many of us have any kind of acclaim. But you've chosen people like us, foolish people, weak people, unimportant people, to accomplish huge things. God, I pray that you'd be jealous for your glory through this people. God, that you would work to bring honor and praise to your name in this city as we step aside and let you work. God, I pray especially for this Christmas season. God, we are uniquely situated here right now for such a time as this to lift up our neighbors and friends and other people in prayer, to devote ourselves to your word and be transformed, and to commit ourselves to gathering with your people regularly, investing in them and letting them invest in us. God, would you do something extraordinary through the ordinary this Christmas season? We lift it all to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.